What we're going to deal with today is related to lost Christianities in the following way. The uh, Orthodox Church, as it formed itself in the 2nd, 3rd, and 4th centuries, uh, built itself around the core of the Apostles' Creed and the Nicene Creed, as you know, <clears throat> which, both of which have this phrase, uh, born of a virgin. Uh, so, as I often say, the entrance points and exit, exit points of, Christ, of Jesus into this world become crucial doctrinal, uh, uh, I guess, places to take a stand. How did he get here? What was he before he came, if anything? And then when he left, what did he become? And there was less of an interest in uh, what he did while he was here, frankly, the, the human Jesus. <clears throat> so for a couple hundred years, um, <clears throat> excuse me, historians have uh, concentrated on that, haven't they? You know, the, the idea of the heavenly pre-existent Christ uh, becoming flesh, being born of a virgin, dying for the sins of the world, uh, being raised from the dead, ascending to heaven, is a creedal rundown on Jesus. But you notice those creeds don't say a single thing about what he taught or his message. And that became the definition of orthodoxy. But there are other branches of the faith that did not go that direction. That is, they uh, insisted that the essential way of life that Jesus taught was uh, something that, that to be emphasized. James is an example. If you read the letter of James, it's as striking for what is absent as for what is present, is it not? <clears throat> What's present is a fairly familiar exposition of uh, standard Jewish ethics. Reminds you a lot of the Sermon on the Mount and even repeat some of those same formulas. Above all, brethren, swear not. Jesus had said, swear not. Josephus says, the Essenes above all will not take oaths. So there's that connection in terms of behavior. But what's missing, if you take out the phrase, Lord Jesus, that occurs at the opening and one time in chapter two when he says, holding the faith of the Lord Jesus, You've removed Jesus from the book. Now that's striking, because you couldn't do that with any other letter. Imagine Paul. Could you take out two references to Jesus, and then you would have this other thing? I don't think so. <clears throat> and so I'm not suggesting you take those out, although I've wondered about that, whether they could be glosses, uh, especially. But if you translate Lord more as rabbi, you know, our master, the faith of our master Jesus, then it has a little bit of a, a different flavor to it. Uh, the anointed one, put it into a different English phraseology that's not as familiar to people. Say, Lord Jesus Christ. It has that very familiar evangelical ring. If you say, the master Jesus who was anointed of God, then it's more descriptive. And so if you take those out, you have uh, the faith once delivered to the saints, as the brother Jude calls it in his letter, in this, uh, that has a different cast to it. And from what we know, and we don't have good sources for this, unfortunately, the Ebionites, or the Nazarenes, I tend to use them as meaning the same thing, although later they get distinguished, they also emphasize the law, as they called it, or the Torah, the teaching better to say teaching. If you say the law, you get into Pauline categories of merit, works, grace. It just has a feeling. Even in English, uh, when we say, you broke the law, you're under the law. If you say Torah, teaching, completely changes the uh, connotation and the sense people have of the word. Uh, and of course, in Hebrew, if you know Hebrew and speak Hebrew and read Hebrew, or even in the English, the word Torah, it carries this idea of, I'm going to learn something. Moses, our teacher, is, is what he is to Jews. He teaches the way. 
And so James seems to be part of that uh, tradition. Jesus certainly seems to be part of that tradition. The idea of a rabbi as a teacher of the way. And so the Ebionites say on one crucial point, uh, he was an ordinary man with a human father. And we think that they would say Joseph was the father from what we know, but there could have been different opinions. But you see where they've drawn the line is that he had a human father. So here is a lost Christianity for sure. <clears throat> Arianism is still around. Arianism is the idea uh, that Jesus did not pre-exist and that he was adopted or divinized or at least acknowledged at the baptism. But he, could, he can still uh, have a virgin birth. Uh, but the Ebionites are not thinking of a virgin birth. They're thinking of sexual union. Mary and Joseph had a child. You see the difference? where the Arians are more arguing about, was there a time when he was not? It's an abstract theological thing. It's, it's philosophical and theological. Did he always exist or did he come to exist? And if, you, if Arius said no, he was the firstborn of all creation. So there was a time when he was not. In the beginning was God, and then he made Jesus, not Jesus, but the Logos, or the one who became Christ, and then later he's born of a virgin. That's not what the Ebionites are saying. The Ebionites, as far as we know, they don't think he pre-existed. He's a human being, just as we're human beings, and received a calling at the baptism where the Spirit of God came upon him. That form of Christianity, I think, doesn't exist in the mainstream anywhere. Arianism still exists. Jehovah's Witnesses would be the main exponents of that, but lots of uh, small... Church of God groups and one God groups you hear if you go on the internet. There are lots of individuals that have started to think, you know, Jesus isn't God. And so they're, they're flirting with Arianism. <laughs> they're flirting with heresy. Whereas the Trinitarian position is the Nicene Creed <clears throat> that Jesus is fully God, fully man. So I want to explore that aspect uh, that entrance point of uh, the birth of Jesus. So this is essentially the question of who was Jesus' father. Now here we have Mary ascending to heaven. Uh, she's had one child, Jesus. God was the father through the Holy Spirit. And she's lived a virginal life. And now she's being taken up into heaven and uh, really begins to become in Catholic tradition a co-mediatrix, co-mediator with uh, Jesus representing uh, the, the one God. Let's look at some texts. Uh, I'm just going to do the canonical text, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. That's enough. And really, the others uh, tend to be derivative and repetitive. I don't think we're going to get much more. But what I find really striking is the sequence. Uh, I'm utterly convinced of the standard theory. There was a cue. Mark was first. And I know people can gainsay that and doubt that and question that. But, you know, my sense of it comes from uh, the 25 years I've done of teaching in the classroom and going over and over and over it with students and putting the charts up with overheads and showing them and uh, I'm just, uh, we don't know everything about Q, but uh, I'm telling you, it existed. <laughs> uh, there was this collection of sayings of Jesus. Uh, we've got a pretty good handle on it. And Mark might have been aware of it, but it, he doesn't use it directly. Uh, I see Mark is thinking, well, we've got the teaching. Let's have the story now. So Mark gives the story of Jesus. But the earliest story of Jesus does not have the birth. Now, we've got to really think about that. If I'm telling you the gospel, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus, and some manuscripts read Jesus Christ, and that's possible, Mark 1.1. 1, 1. Beginning of the gospel of Jesus. There was a man sent from God, John, out in the wilderness. That's the beginning of the gospel. Not a virgin shall conceive and bear a son. 
So what's wrong with Mark? Why, how can he tell the story of someone without introducing that person? So we have to wonder about that. And scholars take that very seriously and do think that the virgin birth developed as a way of uh, dealing with views of Jesus' divinity. So no mention of Jesus' birth and no mention of Mary's husband, Joseph. Now, isn't that interesting? You say, I want to study what Mark says about Joseph. You're done. <laughs> we just did it. We studied it. Same with the birth. And yet, one intriguing reference. We saw this yesterday, Mark 6, 3. Is this not the carpenter, the son of Mary? Now, I take that very seriously. It's early. It's uh, shocking to call him the son of Mary. And the textual editors go crazy with this. They add, is this not the carpenter's son? Is this not the son of Joseph? And is his Mary not with us? And they begin to conflate things from Matthew and so forth. But Mark, in this stripped-down version, is just so stark. And you have to wonder, did readers of Mark ask, uh, okay, let's see, chapter 1, around what, verse 14? And Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee down to the Jordan to be baptized by John. Did anybody ask, who's he? <laughs> Where did he come from? You know, I mean... You just have to think about that. It's just a very, very provocative thing to think about. Now, Matthew expands it. Let's see how we get the expansions. And in the same passage, he's following his source, Mark. It's in chapter 13, verse 55. Is this not the carpenter's son? He editorializes that one word, edits it. Is, this, is not his mother called Mary? So that shocking phrase, son of Mary, is now gone. There's nothing wrong with saying, is not his mother called Mary? That's perfectly fine to say. But to say, is this not the son of Mary, gives you a jolt. Like, what do you mean, son of Mary, in that culture? And now we got the carpenter's son, but why don't we have his name? You know, why don't we say, is this not the son of Joseph the carpenter or something like that? Now, it's not as though Joseph isn't mentioned, but it's almost as though Joseph's not mentioned. He's not there, and the only other time you get Joseph is at the birth. So we do have a birth, right? And the bare facts of the birth are like this. See the verse? Now, the birth of Jesus was like this. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, now he's been introduced by the genealogy is of the line of David. So we do know who he is when we get to that verse. Oh, Joseph, the guy we just traced. Uh, before they came together, that's sexual, she was found to be with child of the Holy Spirit. And Joseph took unto him his wife, he had a dream, you know the story, and knew her not till she'd brought forth a son and he called his name Jesus. Joseph never mentioned again. So this father business is strange, I think. Uh, now, people have wondered for centuries and said, well, he was older, maybe he died early. Uh, Luke passes on a story that he's still around when Jesus is 12, but most of us are very, very uh, nervous about taking that story uh, as history because Josephus tells the same story about himself and other uh, sages of the Mediterranean world. The pro a uh, precocious 12-year-old that goes to the teachers of philosophy and everybody kind of falls back and says, how could you possibly know all these things? You're only a boy. So, that, you know, there's something about the story that makes you wonder whether it's a set piece, just to say Jesus is very wise or something. But we'll get to that. But in terms of Matthew, that's it. And when we do have those references like Jesus and his mother and brothers went here or went there or did this or that, Never Joseph. So it makes you wonder. Uh, he, the birth is not part of Mark's story, and Joseph is no part of Mark's story. Therefore, Matthew doesn't know anything about Joseph. You get the point? 
it's not as though, oh, I have quite a few things about Joseph, but, you know, papyrus is expensive. So <laughs> I won't put it in. He doesn't know anything about Joseph. Matthew has Q, he has Mark, and he has a bit of his own material. I think we can be sure that Matthew gave us what he had. He edits very heavily Q and Mark and puts his own theology in it at crucial places that are really, really obvious. He wants Jesus to be more glorious. I'll give you the best example I can think of in Mark. Jesus is approached by someone who says, Good master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus rebukes the man and says, Why do you call me good? There's only one good God. And Matthew comes to that. Now he's just told about this birth of Jesus. And he thinks, wait a minute. That could be confusing to the reader. Why don't we put it like this? Why do you ask me about the good? Well, that's a bit different, isn't it? Because he didn't ask him about the good directly in terms of the word, but he did say, what is it to be, have eternal life? That's sort of editing. Uh, what do you have at the cross? Earthquakes, resurrections, uh, all kinds of cosmic phenomena. You picture music coming in at the movie, and it's glorious, and darkness and you know it's very dramatic uh, and that's all the way through and if you want to know someone's theology you can look at the ending it's funny Matthew Mark Luke and John it's all the same in John Thomas says my Lord and my God right and in Luke you've got this Pauline message forgiveness of sins will be preached to all nations in my name because that's Paul and then Matthew, all power and glory is given unto me. Isn't that interesting? You go to the end and you get their whole idea. And Mark, and they fled from the tomb and were afraid and said nothing to anyone. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? You know, it just, uh, it's just so reflective of those books. So Matthew doesn't know much about the Father. He's got a name, but he doesn't even put the name the one time he mentions them, he doesn't even put the name. So he could have put the name, but it's just not on the edge of his tongue. Which raises the question, why this birth story? Uh, how did this develop? And we'll get to that question. It has to do with uh, a kind of puzzle. Is the vir did the virgin birth story arise in order to honor Jesus as a divine man? We know this in all uh, sorts of uh, Hellenistic texts, Greco-Roman texts. If you go to my website, there's an article right at the top called Heroes and Gods, where I give you texts about Heracles or Hercules and Zeus and uh, Romulus and so forth, and all lots of other references uh, where you can study more on your own. The divine man, the idea of a human who is so extraordinary he must have a god for a father is very common in Greek and Roman literature. Here we have a painting on a Greek vase that celebrates for us the uh, seduction of Heracles' mother by Zeus. And Zeus disguises himself, not in this painting, but in the story, so that the husband doesn't even really know uh, or rather, the wife doesn't know that it's not the husband, and later it turns out to be Zeus. And that would account for why Heracles or Hercules is so powerful. How could he do all of these wonders? Well, Zeus is his father. She was married, but uh, he's not the father. So is that how the story arose of the virgin birth? Uh, that's, I think, what critical scholars commonly would say. It just fits into that context of embellish legendary material, making Jesus more and more divine. So Matthew gives a story. <clears throat> the other position, which is one that I lean towards, is that that birth story preserves within it a historical kernel of something irregular about Jesus' birth. That this phrase here, she was found with child, not of the Holy Spirit, not saying who, but just that, that Mary was engaged to Joseph, or if, if that's the case, I'm not absolutely positive, but according to this text, 
but she gets pregnant before her marriage, and that that would be the kernel. Now, you see, that's a very different explanation. It's not to make Jesus glorious. It's to account for a very scandalous problem. How did you become pregnant before your marriage and not from your, the man you married? You better explain that. And the explanation is, well, the Holy Spirit is the source of the pregnancy. You see how those are different? Now, that would also serve the other one to say, therefore, Jesus is great and so on. But I, I'm asking the question, why did Matthew uh, and his circles and, and Christians in general begin to tell this story? Was it because of circulating rumors about illegitimacy? And Jane Schauberg and others have explored this, and they've been countered by uh, John Meyer and others that don't accept the illegitimacy thing, but it's out on the table now. Uh, for the last 15, 20 years, these scholars have been talking about you know, whether this illegitimacy thing is something to think about. Now, as you would expect, Luke has quite a bit more, but it's not the same story. I know at Christmas time, when you see your kid in the play, it looks like it's all the same. You know, those shepherds, those wise men, that's Matthew and Luke, they're all together at that manger, even though you look at the text, and it's just very, very different. Luke's got a different story. But look what's missing. It's, it's concentrating on Mary, not Joseph. The angel Gabriel was sent from God into a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. Okay? And she's told, you'll have a child, and she objects and says, well, how could that possibly be? And she's then told by Gabriel, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, the power of the Most High shall overshadow you, therefore also the holy thing which is begotten shall be called the Son of God. Now, Joseph is mentioned here as the man to whom she's betrothed, but there's nothing about he was troubled when he found out the pregnancy, he wondered what to do, he had a dream, none of that is there. And I think when we read texts, especially if you come from a Christian background as I do, in your head are all of these stories and they just tend to kind of merge together. It becomes very difficult to say what's there and what's not because you've got this composite story that you've created, but it's not really anybody's story. It's your story of all your bad, sloppy memories of things you've heard all your life. And to sort it out is important because Luke's telling a discrete story, as you can see here. And it's, 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 uh, it's kind of shocking or it's troubling in a sense because we've got Mary being told that baby is from God. And Joseph goes from Galilee out of Nazareth into Judea, which is called Bethlehem. This is the next time he's mentioned. And what does he have? He has Mary, who's betrothed to him, great with child. So what does he think? You see? If you just read Luke, what does he think? Um, she had left the town for three months and then come back, uh, clearly showing the pregnancy by that time. Remember, down to Elizabeth to visit, according to Luke's chronology. And uh, then the baby's born. But it doesn't really say, there's nothing about, are you going to take her as your wife? And he took her. And even here, uh, you wonder, does this mean they're not married yet? And he's accepting this? Or does he know something else? It's just uh, interesting. So the possibility is open here that, that Joseph uh, has, uh, let's just say, that he might be thinking things that, are different from Matthew because nothing is said. It's silence. Just Joseph took his pregnant, betrothed wife down for the birth. So I think that's really, really interesting. Why is it interesting? Because Luke doesn't want to go there. <laughs> so 
see? I mean, he just, he just sort of leaves that as, as a Mary story. But he does say this, Luke 3, 23. And Jesus himself, when he began to teach, was about 30 years of age. By the way, that's the only phrase anywhere in our Gospels that tells us how old he was. And often whole uh, important ideas hang on a thread like that. You know, think of, about things if that were not there. If that phrase was just out, just take that out. And Jesus, when he began to teach, being the son as was supposed to Joseph, you didn't know how old he was, was he 15, 30, 40, 50, 60, 80? You know, you just would have no idea. So we're grateful to Luke. Uh, we hope he's right. And we built everything on <laughs> the fact that he probably had a good uh, tradition that Jesus was about 30. There's one other correlation that would support that. John is six months older, and he begins preaching just ahead of, of Jesus, probably on his 30th birthday, and that is the age that a priest would begin the work as an adult at age 30, according to the Torah. He sees his work as the spiritual cleansing of the people, and he begins at 30. So that would help correlate it. But as far as a number, this is the only number we've got. By the way, Jesus being a carpenter, there's only one place. You know, everybody knows Jesus is a carpenter, right? That's everywhere. No, it's not. It's right here. Is this not the carpenter? That's it. Now, at, he does say this. Jesus himself, when he began to teach, was 30 years of age, being the son as was supposed of Joseph. So he says that. So the idea would be the society, I mean, if you just read Luke, forget Matthew just for a minute, you could read it like this. Mary knows who the father is. You know, Joseph marries her. Everybody assumes Joseph is the father. Now Luke would say it's the Holy Spirit, but I'm, I'm bringing up this question of, of a more historical view. Is it possible the pregnancy is from a hum, another man, not Joseph, but he takes her anyway, and the society basically accepts that it's Joseph, until some rumors break out, as we'll see. Uh, the parents are mentioned. Uh, there's a typo there, but that's okay. They went up to Jerusalem for the festival of Passover. He was 12. Your father and I have been searching. Even there, your father and I, I guess you don't have to say Joseph and I, but his parents, it reminds you a little bit of the muting of uh, Joseph's name that comes later. No more references. But notice this. Did you not know I must be about my father's house? My father? It's not my father. My father's God. So that's interesting. The father contrast isn't it in that verse. Your father and I are anxious. You almost want, who's my father? You're not my father. God's my father. Now, here I'm just imagining, just like when I say James might have looked like Jesus and the disciples in James found comfort after Jesus' death. I don't know that. Maybe they were opposites. But I want, you know, you have to wonder about things. You have to imagine, especially if you're interested in novels and movies as I am, to try to, uh, as best we can, construct a story that might make sense. And I have wondered whether if the illegitimacy thing is true, which, which I tend to think it is, that is that Mary became pregnant <coughs> from someone other than Joseph, but he took her anyway, that part of the strength of Mary would be to tell Jesus as he's growing up this tremendous burden that a child would feel. There's a book called Fatherless in Galilee. I can't recall now the author's name. Do you happen to know Charles? Fatherless in Galilee, but it's about the psychology of growing up fatherless in that culture. It's footnoted in my book, so you can look it up. And I picture Mary, this is for the movie now, okay, so I'm dreaming, but I picture Mary saying when Jesus comes in crying at age four and five, they call me a mamzer, a bastard. I picture her saying, listen, honey, you are holy. 
and the way you got here is absolutely beyond anybody in this village, and you're destined for something great. You know, I picture her giving this child a confidence and a feeling uh, about his origins. Now, did she tell him the virgin birth story? I don't know that. I mean, I don't tend to think she did, because I don't think that, that uh, Jesus lacked a human father. So if that's correct, she would have probably said something, whether she identified the father or not. Your father was a great man, a holy man, and don't listen to the gossip. This is for the movie, okay? It's, it's compelling. <laughs> uh, then one other reference. When he came to Nazareth where he'd been brought up, he went up to the synagogue Sabbath day. And I've left things out because of the slide. But, you know, they're saying, oh, who's this? And how can you say all this? Who do you think you are? Is this not Joseph's son? So Luke knows the term Joseph's son, as was supposed, son of Joseph. But in terms of any thing about Joseph past him taking Mary down for the birth, nothing. So again, I'm going to say he doesn't know anything. Well, Luke looks for things all the time. He gives us a genealogy. He gives us the age of Jesus. A lot of things in the book of Acts that he's dug up and pulled together. He's a source man. I mean, what the source we call L, Luke's unique material, it's, it's, it's very plentiful. He's gone around and found things. His basic narrative is still Mark, which means silence about Joseph. Now, you can't just pass that off, I don't think, if you're going to be honest with the material. Why this silence about Joseph? And just to say he died early, which we don't even know, uh, I'm not so sure that that solves it. <clears throat> and uh, I, I'm with Mark. Mark, I think, is saying, you know, let's don't talk about all that. Here's the story. And he tells no story. John, no birth account. But now we're into the world of theology, which leads us into the creeds and the logos. The word became flesh and lived among us. Presumably by some kind of birth, since he has a mother, and presumably without a father, but nothing said. Now, in chapter 6, same scene. See, the same Mark and scene repeated now for the fourth time, where they're going, who are you? Are you not? And here we have it. Is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? Now, I didn't put this in my book, but I sat for a while one night when I was writing the book and thought, hmm, maybe I will put it in. I wonder in Greek, if you look at it particularly in Greek, Charlie, whose father and mother we know, whether that might be because of the next phrase, we were not born of fornication, a reference to the father. Meaning, in other words, there's two men here in this sentence. But I didn't put it in because I wasn't sure and I keep thinking and going back and forth. See, it could just be redundant. Is this not the son of Joseph? We know his father and mother, meaning Joseph. Do you see how you could also read it? Is this not the son of Joseph? You know, that's what we call him, right? because Joseph adopted this, him, so to speak. But we also know his father and mother, meaning his mother Mary and his father. We, we know about that because this is polemical. Uh, and it gets even more polemical. From chapter 6 to chapter 8 to chapter 10, all people want to do is kill Jesus. Right? It's just like, kill Jesus. It should be called, kill Jesus. Uh, that should be the name of the book. It's very stark. And, it wanted, and they have these really heated exchanges uh, in the book with enemies of Jesus who are doubting him and questioning his divinity mainly. And at one point they say, we were not born of fornication. When he tells them, your father's the devil. And they retort by saying, well, if you want to get into who's <laughs> the father thing, we can play that one. Uh, and at least we know our father. <laughs> See, so uh, there are quite a few scholars that question whether that's a reference to the illegitimacy because it could be taken more metaphorically. You know, God is our father. What he's implying we're spiritually bastards. But I just wonder if something else might be going on in these two verses. But whatever, 
There are no other references. So once again, what is going on here? No other references. No birth. No stories about uh, Jesus. So who was Jesus' father? Uh, the standard theological position, and Matthew and Luke hold this, right, with the virgin birth stories. No human father. God is the father by the Holy Spirit. The Ebionites, I think, generally said his father was Joseph. And many, many historical Jesus scholars, you could just name them one after another, Bart Ehrman, Ed Sanders, Paula Friedrichson, on and on and on, Robert Funk. I think all of them would say, you know, who's Jesus' father? Joseph. Joseph's the father. So they would take this story as just mythology to exalt Jesus as having no father. But there's also the possibility of taking it as a story to address the charge of the uh, pregnancy. Didn't you become pregnant before your marriage and Joseph, the guy you married, he's not the father, right? That, that it, they could have arisen to address that. Now, if that's all we had, I think we just have to stop. And I would probably go with the mythology idea that the birth stories were told to exalt Jesus as a divine man in Hellenistic religions. I tend to be, it's probably my background, I don't know, some of you will laugh at this, I tend to be more conservative with the text. Uh, well, Charlie knows, all the academics, April, you know this too, I mean, the way my colleagues would criticize me is like, Tabor's so naive, he like believes things that Luke says. I mean, he's almost like a fundy. <laughs> you know, Jesus, Luke says Jesus is 30, Tabor thinks he was probably 30, and he builds this whole story about Jesus baptized in Judea, Tabor thinks he did. He's finding the cave where it happened. See, I, I can be seen now to a conservative Christian who reads my book, it would be like, are you kidding? You know, you're headed straight for damnation because you don't accept all, you're throwing out all these things and doubting all the text. And So there's a method to the madness. It's actually systematic. It's not... Uh, when I make a judgment about something, it's for an argued reason. That's what I tell my students. They say, well, are we allowed to say this or that? They don't say argue. I want them to say that. What if we think this? I said, you can think anything you want, but give me the argument. Give me your three best reasons for holding it. And also give me two or three reasons against it that are the best. And then you would have an A paper. But don't just say, I think that probably Jesus was born of God because my faith tells me. Fine. Uh, you know, on essays, we don't ask them what they think about that anyway. But, but I could say, discuss the traditions of the birth of Jesus in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and critically examine all the possible interpretations, you see? And they would have to really go into it and argue it out. And, and then where they came out on it, like if they said, well, I'm convinced by this or that, uh, would be uh, up to them. So I do... Um, think that within those stories is embedded a historical kernel and that's what I would ask uh, scholars who don't share that view. I would just ask the question, do you think Mary became pregnant before the marriage, not from Joseph? See, I'm accepting that as a, a kernel of truth. I don't know if I call it truth, but a, as a hypothesis I'm accepting. If you do, then the story wouldn't have arisen just to glorify Jesus. It would serve that purpose. Now, like I said, if, if the Gospels were all we had, I don't know that I could make that argument. But it, they're not all we have. We have an unnamed father named in quite a few sources. So I don't see how we could ignore that. I knew when I wrote the book, my editors knew, I was warned, you know, if you put the Pantera stuff in, forget it. You know, you're going to be in the biggest trouble. You're going to be damned and you're going to be slandered. And, because, and that's indeed what happened. If you look at the press reports on my book, they're all on my website, JesusDynasty.com. Uh, almost always the lead is, Tabor says Jesus' father was a Roman soldier. 
And the two assumptions are that he was a Roman soldier when he became the father, which I never say, and secondly, that it would be bad to be a Roman soldier. You know, the assumption is, a Roman soldier? How awful. Now, on your handout, look at the first page. The smaller print at the bottom. In the Tosefta, which are the additions to the Mishnah, we have passing, two passing stories. I say passing stories because they refer to Jesus as Yeshua ben Pantera, but not in a polemical way. They're simply letting you know which Yeshua they're talking about. That's the key to my argument. If they were polemical, making fun of him or slandering him, then we'd have to ask, well, they're enemies and they just want to slander Jesus. But because these stories are not of that nature... These are simply saying, and they're also said in Sepphoris. That's important. Four miles from Nazareth. So they're regional stories being told in rabbinic literature. There's a rabbi, Eleazar ben Dama, and a serpent bit him. And Jacob, a man of Kafar Sama, who Balcom argues is part of the Jesus family. He tries to identify him, and I think it's quite convincing. He, he came to cure him in the name of Yeshua ben Pantra. So that's good. This is like the evangelist, in the name of Jesus Christ, I command you, you know, leave. I mean, he's curing him in the name. It's a positive use of the name, showing that in the region of Galilee in the first century, at Sepphoris, people are using this name. You know, Yeshua... Uh, they go, what Yeshua? That's a very common name. I know quite a few Yeshuas. I know Yeshua ben Yaakov. I know Yeshua ben Yosef. Yeshua ben Simon. Which one are you? Pantera. Oh, Pant. Yeah, that one. He's from Nazareth, right? See? I mean, seems to be known. And he said, you are not permitted, ben Dhamma, and I will bring you a proof that he may heal me. But he'd not finished bringing a proof when he died. But Ishmael said... Happy are you, Ben Dama, for you've departed in peace. As it's good that that snake bit you and you died because you could have been healed in the name of a heretic. See, Jesus is thought of as uh, not good here. For uh, you've departed in peace and have not broken through the ordinance of the wise. For upon everyone who breaks through the fence of the wise, punishment comes at last. As it is written, whoever breaks through a fence, a serpent shall bite him. What did Yeshua Ben Pantera do? He broke through the fence of the Torah. He didn't accept the Pharisaic rabbinic rulings that were probably in force in his village growing up, right? And he didn't accept the interpretation of keeping the Sabbath and certain sorts of purity laws, uh, relationships with women. You know, we get hints of ways they would have been upset with him. And so uh, if I get healed in his name, I've broken through the fence. And what does the Proverbs say, or Ecclesiastes? A serpent will bite him. See the idea? So uh, you don't want to follow somebody like Yeshua ben Pantra. But it's not a slander, it's identification. And the next story, I think, is the same way. It's, I'm going to let you read it because it's much longer. But if you go down to part D... Once I was walking in the streets of Sepphoris, and I met Jacob of Kephar uh, Sichnim, and Balcom argues that's the same person, and he said to me a word of minut, a word of heresy, in the name of Yeshua ben Pantra, and it pleased me. And as I heard, this guy told me something Yeshua taught, and I liked it. I thought, yeah, that, that sounds pretty good. Who, this guy had some good teachings. And I was arrested for words of minute because I transgressed the words of the Torah. And doesn't the proverb say, keep your way far from her and do not go near the door of her house. For many a victim you, she has laid low. Meaning, at this time in Sepphoris, which is a Jewish town, there are arguments, halakhic arguments about following the Torah. And those following Yeshua ben Pantra are being uh, uh, ostracized and put out of the synagogue and told that they're uh, teaching heresy. This is a strictly inner Jewish thing. I don't think they're teaching anything 
that broadly speaking would be called heresy in Judaism. Judaism takes in quite a few you know, possible interpretations. I mean, as long if you believe Moses gave the Torah at Sinai, Israel's a chosen people, he gave us the land and we're called to follow him, the rest is interpretation, right? Sadducees, Pharisees, Essenes, Nazarenes. But one group will look at another group, like in a little Arkansas town, you can have two Baptist churches. To a sociologist, they're absolutely identical. They eat chicken on Sunday. They, <laughs> they marry the same people. I mean, they're identical. But you ask them, they'll say, no, we don't even take communion with them. It's some point of doctrine, some Calvinistic fine point of interpretation where that group's damned and this group, you know, is right. Now, it's maybe overplaying it a little, but you see the point. They're all in this arena of discussion. So that's where we first get the name. And the name is uh, Pantera, Yeshua ben Pantera, and it's in a Jewish context. I don't think it's Jewish slander. I think it's identification. Now, the response of, uh, uh, I'm sorry, the next text is Celsus. You've got it at the top. Celsus is a sophisticated... Greek philosopher who writes a refutation of Christianity. Uh, this is in the second century. And Origen, the great church father, the great intellect, the great Platonist, I might say, student of Clement, he refutes it line by line, like the Shem Tov text, I mentioned this. So he quotes Celsus and then he gives his Answer. He quotes Celsus again and gives his answer. So we can pull out the quotes of Celsus even though it's Origen's book. We don't have Celsus and we can get Celsus and we think he's very fair by quoting his opponent and then answering it. So we have everything the opponent said. So we reconstruct the book of Celsus. If you want a copy of it in my book, The Jesus Dynasty, there are footnotes, and when I mention this, I tell you how to get the edition in English. It's really wonderful to read. So at one point, Celsus says uh, uh, what he'd heard from Jewish sources, that Mary, uh, is it not the case, I'm breaking into the middle, that when her deceit was discovered, to wit that she was pregnant by a Roman soldier named Pantera, she was driven away by her husband, the carpenter, and convicted of adultery. Now, he's heard this. It's, it's going around. And it's wrong because we have no record that he was, she was driven away or that the husband rejected her. So what he's heard has been further embellished. But the part for me that uh, stands out is the name. He knows the same name. See, the story's gotten garbled, but you see there's a core. This is how rumors work. There's always that core. And the core is Pantera, and he adds Roman soldier. Uh, now, I don't know if, if uh, he's got that right or not, but he's picked up some gossip on the street, you might say. The reaction of many modern scholars, even good ones, <laughs> But I'm trying to find the origin of this. I think it, it, I've got it back as far as the 1700s. On my blog, if you read back, you'll find I've discussed this with some scholars. But uh, that it's a play on words. In other words, Yeshua ben Pantera means Jesus, son of the virgin. But virgin is Parthenos, and they're using Pantera to make fun of him, saying he's son of a panther. Pantera means panther in Greek. And so a panther is supposed to be like a lustful animal. So he's the son of some, you know, roving uh, uh, fornicator or whatever. And it's sort of like, ha, 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 you call him, panther, you call him par son of a parthenos, we call him son of a panther. That's been the explanation. Deisman, Adolf Deisman, in 1906 published an important article where he argued, no, this is not a play on words. First of all, it doesn't even fit very well linguistically. Secondly, we have no references to Jesus as son of a virgin. But third, uh, there are Greek and Latin tomb inscriptions with the word pantera, 
and it's used in particular and favored by Roman soldiers. Now, you will hear, I know when I was on Nightline, they brought on a guy, uh, I don't remember his name now, but he uh, was basically quoting the party line of the Evangelical Christian Church. He's from Trinity Evangelical. That's his job. And he said, oh, well, you know, we know this story, and Tabor, you know, is stretching it, and it's a very common name in the time. It's not a common name. If it was a common name, Diceman wouldn't have had to point out Diceman found five references, three to Roman soldiers, but it is a name favored by Roman soldiers. So he, Diceman's point was, instead of dismissing the story, maybe we should investigate. But he didn't go further than that. He just uh, made that point. Now, I'm going to this. Uh, in, at the turn of the previous century, no, the turn of the previous, the previous, because we're in the 21st. Like 1892, I think it was. I don't have my notes on that with me. But uh, a French uh, archaeologist and explorer uncovered an ossuary in North Jerusalem. This is virtually undiscussed and unknown. As far as I know, in my book, it's the first time it's been pointed out. I think it's absolutely more important than Dyson, a Jewish ossuary. And it's got a Joseph in it, a guy named Joseph, in the tomb. It's a Jewish tomb. And it says, of Joseph Pantera of Drusus, and then it breaks off. So it's giving the name of someone else in that ossuary. And he is the, when you say of on an, on an inscription, you put it in the genitive, you mean there. The, this is the ossuary of, meaning this is the ossuary of Joseph Pantera, who's the son of Drusus. You see the idea? So here's somebody called Joseph Pantera in Jerusalem using that name. So now we've got it in a Jewish culture. Interesting. So I think that compounds the strength of Deisman's original argument. But even more to the point, Origen replies to Celsus, and Epiphanius picks up on it later, and they don't say, oh, that's just a pun on the word Parthenos. They don't say that. That's much, much later. That's a modern argument. What do they say? Yeah, it's true. There is a guy named Pantherus in the family. Can you believe that? They say that. He was Joseph's father, Jesus Legal father Joseph, his father was named Pantera. So the name's in the family, and so, yeah, they could call Jesus son of Pantera because it's like his grandfather. So you see, that's interesting. Now, if they thought it was some outside slander, you know, from the enemies, they would have probably come up with another argument. They're accepting it. Their strategy is to accept it. And then say, but that doesn't mean any guy named Panther is the father. In fact, the Holy Spirit's the father. God's the father. Jesus has no human father. They go back to this. But I think that's a, a very, very strong point. So our earliest response accepts the name Panther as a Jewish name in the family. And... I hope I've advanced the discussion a little bit because I, I don't see this in any of the books that usually just refer to the, oh yeah, there's this thing about Pantra, but that's not important. So I think it might be important to look at. So back to my editors, they kind of warned me and so forth, and I said, but if I don't cover it, how can I be you know, giving a, a good account of what we know about Jesus and how do we know it? whether it's right or not. And I don't ever say Jesus' father was a Roman soldier. Now, Deisman does publish this picture of this particular Roman soldier, Tiberius Julius Abdes Pantera from Sidon, who's 62. We'll read it in a minute because I have a better picture of it. And he dies in Germany sometime in uh, probably the late first century, and he just, he doesn't say, and that's Jesus' father, he doesn't say that. What he says is, here would be an example of someone from Palestine 
with the Hebrew name Abdes is a Semitic name meaning servant. Uh, it could be servant of Isis, but if he's Jewish, and could be servant of, of Yahweh. We've got both examples. But his name is Pantera. He's taking the emperor's name as his citizenship name. Now, that tomb is located just here in Germany, uh, off the Rhine River. I've got a, there's the Rhine River. It's right about there. Uh, it's a place, near a place called Bad Kreuznach. You wouldn't find the other place on the map, but Bad Kreuznach you could find. And so I decided uh, last fall, I was writing the book and I just took off a weekend. I left Friday, came back Sunday. Can you believe it? Because <laughs> I wanted to see this, uh, if I could find it. All I had and all anybody had as far as I knew was Dysman had mentioned it in 1906. I've got two world wars. <laughs> so I began writing uh, museums and running it down and I found uh, the curator of the Bad Kreuznach Museum. Here's the lovely little town of Bad Kreuznach. And I walk in, it's called the Rumerhalle. It's built over a Roman villa that existed at the time, a Roman soldier outpost and nearby is a cemetery at Bingerbrook, which you would probably not find on a map unless you had a big map of Germany. So this is really interesting. It's what they're going to do up at Megiddo, I think. Instead of move everything to some museum, they're going to move the prison at Megiddo and build the whole museum over the complex. It's going to be the most incredible site in Israel. You're going to get to go through a Roman army camp, the earliest church ever found, uh, and it'll all be part of a museum, kind of like they've done at Sepphoris with the, the villa, you know, where you can walk around and see the banquet room and so forth. But this is going to be vast. That's what they did here. So when you go in here, you see mosaics and dining room. They built the museum over the place. Now, it happens to house the tombstone. The tombstone wasn't found here. You can see it's been moved. It was from... Bingerbrook, Bingerbrook, which is just uh, probably five or six miles away. And so when I got there, the curator, she said, oh, oh why are you interested in this? Do you think he's Jesus' father? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, uh, I don't take, uh, I, I don't, you know, <coughs> conclude or whole, whole views on things like that. I'm investigating. You know, I, I, don't, I don't know what I think. And I said, why do, you, why do you even ask that? What, what are you uh, getting from people? And she said, oh, we have film crews come here all the time. Uh, because it was published in a book by Eon Wilson called Jesus the Evidence, and he put uh, that Diceman picture. But he didn't put a new picture, so I don't think he went there. I haven't seen anyone ever that's published a recent picture. This is the first one I've ever seen. And I put myself in it to be sure people knew it was mine. So, uh, so my son took this picture, not the painter, the, another son. And he, uh, so in the credits of the foreign editions, they actually have the name under the picture. Mine has it in the back, the English edition. So he's real excited that every time he picks up, you know, the latest, the Japanese, the Portuguese, there's my name right, right there in your book. <laughs> so... Anyway, I'm measuring and studying it. Uh, unfortunately, the head's gone, but these are pretty stylized. This is a tomb monument. But then the curator uh, and I got along very well. She warmed up to me. She saw that I knew what I was doing, and I told her everything I knew. We just sat down and, uh, at her table, and she had brought all this stuff. And she says, well, you know, I've never shown this to anybody else, but I'm going to show you. And I didn't, put it in, I didn't publish it in the book, I don't think. No, I didn't. She said, I have a painting of the original discovery. Let's put the lights down on this one. Made in 1859, they were building the railroad station at Bingerbrook, and they came across the cemetery. Now, we don't have dig records of anything from 1859. This is a construction crew. 1859. How are we going to know anything? She's got this painting of what it looked like. In the back, I said, how did you find that? She said, when I got your message you were coming, I decided to look around the museum, and I went down the basement, and I just found this painting. I said, you didn't know you had it? Nope, she didn't know she had it. It's a copy of an original. The original is in a museum in Germany. I'm going to find it. But look, at you see the railroad worker? 
and they're building the railroad and they've cut through this wall and all of a sudden they come across the German, I mean the, uh, the uh, cemetery. And I thought, okay, right here you can see where the funerary urns were and tombstones. And I think this is our man here um, that we're interested in for this at least. So, let me go back. There's a close-up of the inscription, and here's what it says. Um, you can see the Latin, and then uh, it's written in full Latin script here because they abbreviate. See, HSE, here uh, is situated, or here lies, and then you've got the German, the German translation. Essentially, it reads, uh, and you've got it also on your... If you want to read English, the German's pretty easy since we're doing names, right? But there's the English if you need help. Tiberius Julius Abdes Pantera of Sidon, age 62, a soldier of 40 years service, of the first cohort of archers lies here. Well, that really helps because we've got his age when he dies, we've got his term of service, we've got where he's from, we've got his name and his forename, so his nickname is, his name is Abdes, but his nickname is Der Panther, the Panther, and he is of the first cohort of archers. He's an archer, and uh, I think you can see. No, you can't really see it. He has some arrows in his hand right here, but the picture's not sharp enough in that slide to see it. I've got some others. Um, so what I did in, a, in the book is to just discuss whether, it, by some fluke of history, you know, if this particular uh, Roman soldier was from, he's from Sidon, which is, uh, oh, 30, 40 miles north of Sepphoris, you know, on the coast. It's in Lebanon. We've been seeing that a lot on the map lately. And uh, his, uh, that, this first cohort, we know something about their history. They were taken to Dalmatia and then up to the Rhine River and stationed on the frontier. And so he's got this 40-year career. We don't know the date he died. If, if it doesn't fit, he might be eliminated as a possible person. But I see it as just illustrating the possibilities uh, of, of the reality. That is, a, a soldier named Pantera from Palestine from the first century that uh, was possibly Jewish. Now, the argument about what he was Jewish will be disputed. I have no doubt that Dr. Strange will pick up on some of this and, and uh, counter it and say, well, you know, he could be serving ISIS for all we know in, in that review of the book, but we'll see. But on the website, I've kept putting new evidence that we're finding I've got a graduate student writing a thesis on this now. And we're becoming more and more convinced that this name uh, is a Hebrew name and this guy is a Jewish soldier. We're doing lots of more research on Jewish soldiers. And whether we're really interested in the, what else was found at that cemetery, say. And coin evidence, one funerary urn survives. I haven't found it yet, but that would be interesting to run down and find that. Uh, I'm just amazed that anything survives. 1859, but they've got, so there's a lot of study to do, and I'm going to work on it. But I do mention in the book one interesting story right here. Can you read that? This is Mark 7. Uh, he's down in Galilee. This is the oddest story. It says, and from there he rose and went away into the borders of Tyre and Sidon, and he entered into a house and would not ha and have no man know it, and he could not be hid. And then this Syrophoenician woman comes up, and I think you know the rest of the story. Now, let me give you just a little more of that, because when he leaves, it's kind of interesting too. I should have just done the whole. And she besought him to cast out the demon and so forth, and he makes his famous statement about the children and the dogs. Oops, I need some more because I want to, you to see how 
how he exits then. And again he went out from the borders of Tyre and came through Sidon into the Sea of Galilee through the midst of the borders of the Decapolis. Just sort of an odd story. It's only in Mark. I mean, it's not only in Mark. Matthew retells it, but it's in Mark as the original story. And I just thought it was interesting that Sidon and Tyre are mentioned, that Jesus goes there. I'm not saying he went to visit Daddy, okay? <laughs> Daddy's in Germany. <laughs> uh, but what I'm saying is he's... Uh, that for a person in Upper Galilee and in Sepphoris, Upper and Lower Galilee, to take a trip to the coast is not, is just reported without, without note. And it, it, and it is odd that he even would do it, I think. I mean, some sort of association with that area. Meaning Jews were there and people were there and he went into a house, he knew somebody there. Now, there's this entire side and connection in the life of Jesus, whether it's from his father or not. That would really have to be for the movie, wouldn't it? And boy, could we do something with that <laughs> in a movie. <laughs> but it just, because people might say, well, that's so remote. I mean, Tyre, Sidon, Jesus never would have anything to do with that. But we got this story where he goes there, goes into a house, stays, and says, would not have anyone know it. So it's a private trip. He's doing something there. So that's just interesting. I don't know at Mark 7 particularly. You'd have to look. I don't think he's on the run too much there. Mm -mm. So here's the thing I want to say. Uh, how much time is left? Two minutes? Okay. Um, we'll just have to take a little overtime, Kathy. <laughs> but not much. Because uh, I want to say something and then I'll allow two or three questions. Uh, let's say that this is the father of Jesus and he was a Roman soldier and... Uh, you know, this is the way it was. I think what's important to realize is you know nothing about the circumstances of the story, even if that were the case. And so what really irritates me about some of the criticisms, oh, do, you know, Tabor says Jesus fought the Roman soldier, is the assumption that that would be a horrible thing when you know nothing about it. In other words, I want to stand up for Mary, if it were true, and say for her, since she's gone, uh, keep your mouth shut. I and I alone know about my relationship with that man. It's nobody's business. And he wouldn't have been a Roman soldier when it happened. They're probably 15, 16 years old. You see? So to make all the assumptions like, oh, raped by a Roman soldier, fell in love at the well with the Roman soldier. This, this would not have to be the case. The point is we don't know anything about that. All we know is that he's called the son of Pantera. It is a name that's used by Roman soldiers, and that's a story going around. So I, I just like, it, that was real hard. I didn't really get that across in the book. I tried to say we shouldn't make those assumptions, but I, I notice it's universally taken as the most horrible thing you could ever think or say. Well, how would you know that? What if it's a wonderful story? What, it's, what if it's a love story of the ages? What if he's from the lost tribes of Israel? <laughs> You think that's funny? Think about it. What if he's from the tribe of Joseph? And, uh, you know, Greek mercenary troops uh, uh, that were scattered, and uh, he has this Jewish or Israelite heritage. Maybe he's the one that uh, was chosen to be the father. 